Hey everybody, what's going on? Happy Sunday. We're back, we're back, we're back, girl. Okay, for another now that we're grown. So, this is one of my all-time favorite movies. Like, it's literally top three. Um, it might be top two, if I'm keeping it a buck, about how much I tortured my family members by making them watch this movie over and over and over and over again to no avail. They had to lie to me and tell me there was a sparkle too in order to make, you know, let them watch something else. It was sad. But either way, y'all, this is my favorite movie, which is why I use the, the cover from the old VHS box. Because there, there's a new cover for the DVD box that I have, but I had to, I had to use the one from the VHS back in the day that I had. Okay, <laughs> it's very, it's a very serious situation. Okay, now listen, just so y'all understand, there's gonna be some singing. There's gonna be a lot of singing. This is a singing movie. If you don't like me singing, if you're not used to me singing, if it's a problem for you, this ain't the one for you. So do me a favor, just go ahead and back on out. Go and watch one of the ones that has less music in it. Okay, why did I get married too? Uh, was the last night that were grown that I did, and that did not have such a profound playlist such as Sparkle, which is also a soundtrack redone by Aretha Franklin and produced by Curtis Mayfield. It's very serious, okay? And to your question, Kayla, the 1970s version is the one that I, 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 like it's the one like it's the one that me and Whitney Houston grew up watching child okay so <laughs> okay in order for her to go and recreate it the second time and the only reason I like that one is because it, I felt like I used to watch Sparkle over and over again like I wanted the ending to change and she made a sparkle and she changed the ending and I liked that and I appreciated that and that felt so befitting for those of us that watched this movie the way we did as kids. Like just feeling like she wasn't going to die. Like sister wasn't going to die, Lord. But she still died. It was a shame. But we're going to get into it, y'all. So, okay, hold up. Let me go ahead and, and you know, make stuff cute first. <laughs> Okay, because, you know, that's what you can do with the ecam thing, girl. <clears throat> All right, hold on. Let me, let me clip my throat. <laughs> let me clip my throat. All right, and we're here. Hi, everybody. Hi. Um, yes, I am not blonde, in case you missed it. Um, I'm trying to become accustomed. It's not the usual. Haven't had dark hair in I don't know how long. Like, I feel like it's been like six years or something like that. <clears throat> so get used to it girl okay um but we're about to get go ahead and jump into it all right i hope everybody is having a good day i hope y'all ready i hope y'all like the video i hope y'all enjoy it most of all i hope y'all enjoy the singing because this is one of my favorites okay for that okay <clears throat> okay so opening scene is almost the entire cast in the choir Okay, everybody is a grown adult looking like they a child. Precious Lord, take my hand, lead me on, let me stay. I am tired, I am weak, I am all. You know, this is a specific one. Through the storm, because you know, it, it's, 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 it's high pitch one, it's the fast one, and then there's a slower one we're going to sing later on, okay? But that's the opening scene. Okay, how y'all gonna come, child? Listen, how y'all gonna come dislike the video already? You mad at the singing already? Y'all be hating on me. Like, y'all really come to hate on me. Like, that that's crazy. <laughs> okay? Anyway, that, that's obscene. Like, that's just, that's crazy. Um, But let's go ahead and get into it. So, as I was saying, opening scene, almost the entire cast, full adults, playing children in this choir scene, Okay? And Sister and Levi are flirting with each other, you know what I'm saying? Smiling and all of that, you know, rubbing elbows and all of that in the Lord's house. 
Then we see the girls having having like a little night out on the front porch okay you got sticks doo -doo 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 -doo. he's working on music okay he wants to turn them into a music group doo -doo 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 -doo. yes baby okay yes baby that's what we're gonna do this whole movie because i know this movie by heart to that degree <laughs> okay so mama okay mama's name is effie all right y'all child is alice Alice, uh, what's this lady name, y'all? Help me, because I'm always forgetting people's names when I need to get them. Mary Alice, child, okay? Do -do 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 -do. All right, look, come on upstairs, y'all. Get from off this porch. It's time to come inside, y'all. Spend too much time in the streets. Mama want them to come upstairs to their dark-ass apartment. I was just like, it is crazy. The streets are lit. People are outside. There's fresh air. And you mad because the kids are sitting outside on the porch where you can see them? <laughs> Child, I guess. Um, but sister yells up, come on, ma, it ain't even dark yet. So we already setting the, the scene that the mama is protective of her girls. Her girls want to be out on the streets. Okay, that's just, <laughs> that's. That's what we starting off with. And sister wants to fight back against being pulled back into the house. All right. Then we got Miss Waters. Miss Waters tells Effie, you keep that eye on the oldest. She's busting at the seams. Child, everybody mama had a Miss Waters, an old messy ass old lady that was always paying way too much attention to what everybody was doing. So somehow you would end up getting in trouble for some sneaky shit you did, thinking you got away with it. But oh no, Miss Waters saw you on the roof making out with sticks. Mm-hmm. Just lucky that Effie wasn't bothered by, by uh, Sparkle making out with sticks on the roof, even though... Sticks was like 18 and Spark was 15. We're going to let it go for now. We're going to let it go for now. That's a reasonable age difference for, for most of us. We're just going to let that, that three-year age difference go. we just going to breathe right on through it. Um, but yes, when the girls come in, Mrs. Waters tells sisters how pretty she looks. And they always was fake and phony, right? Talk bad about you behind your back. Call you fast and then going to tell you you're pretty when you come upstairs. That's why a sister was like, are you here again? And listen, understand how there's a part of me that always will have her hands like in, in some type of <laughs> this movement. Okay, like the hands for some reason are always kind of like just you know, elegantly about because sister's hands used to always be like right up in here for some reason. Like she was just always like, you know, <laughs> you tell me what does it mean? Okay. Like the hands are always here. Okay. So it was just funny to me when she walked through the door, like a grown woman, like, are you here again? All right. <laughs> Child Effie says, listen, do not be disrespectful. And she asked to see everybody's homework. Oh, you want to see my homework, huh? <laughs> I want to see it. Whenever I do that, y'all, because I have done that in <laughs> reviews before, been like, I want to see it. That's where I get that from. Effie telling them that she wants to see the homework. And you're like, oh, you want to see my homework, huh? And you're like, yes. Okay, let me see it. Dolores says, mama, you ain't got to iron our clothes. We old enough to iron our own clothes. You ain't our maid. Okay, and her mama says, oh, well, you know, I love taking care of those I love, ironing clothes for those I love. And Dolores thought she was going to walk up on Effie and say, oh, I suppose you love them crackers down on Long Island you work for. She said, girl, you better get away from me before I give you the sign of a cross in a place you won't forget. <laughs> okay, listen. Back in the day when you had to sign the children's homework to make sure they did it. But Dolores was doing way too much as well. Dolores grown ass dressed in that little petticoat dress. Like, <laughs> I, how old is everybody? I feel like Dolores was probably like 14, Sparkles 15, Sister 17. That's what it felt like, okay? But either way, Dolores was like revolutionary. She's the, she's the one that's going to go and get involved in the civil rights movement. She's going to go and get involved in, you know, the betterment of the people. Like you can tell her energy was always paying closer attention to the bigger picture. And I feel like she was shunned for that. I don't think we really paid attention to Dolores' character as much, but Dolores was seeing shit off rip. You know, looking at her mom like, mom, why are you working this hard? 
you know, taking care of these white people. Like, why are we not trying to have something of our own? Like, Dolores wanted something of their own. She wanted them to get out of this class of having to clean up behind white people because essentially it made it no different than being a slave. That's why they kept talking about it. Yeah, being a maid. Because it's like being a slave. And Dolores was seeing it. I feel like Dolores was paying attention to a lot of the stuff that was going on. And because of that, she was aggravating to everybody. You know what I'm saying? So Sparkle goes on the roof to dry some of the clothes. Because, you know, we got to hang them up for them to dry. And Sticks is up there working on some music for when they start the group. And he tells her, you know, that she smells real good. And he walking up on her. And it's just like, this is real predatory, sir. First of all, you older than her. Second of all, she don't really want it. But this is how I feel like a lot of us, a lot of us had this mindset. And I'm mad at the way we were raised because y'all raised the men to be predatory. And then you raised the girls to be, you know what I'm saying? Just always, oh, oh my God, it feels so good. It must be a sin. And that's just so not okay. Because essentially every girl is not sparkle that's, you know, playing hard to give but really wants this man's affections. Like, everybody's not like that. Like, it was another moment, too, that we're going to get into that felt that, you know, the, the time frame in the 70s was very violent towards women in these, in these, like, you know, scenes. Like, these scenes that are supposed to be romantic between teenagers, if you pay attention, we're very like predatory and violent. So she's, you know, walking away from him and he just kisses her. Like he asked her how old she was and she was like, she's 15. Then he says she's real pretty for a girl. It's like, who do, who, what do you mean she's real pretty for a girl? Such a weird thing to say. <laughs> like that was such a weird thing to say to me. But it shows you the mindset, like, of the men. You know, like, you can't even give a woman an outright compliment. You pretty for a girl, you know? She says that she has to go, and he asks if she's ever been kissed, and then he just kisses her. She tells him, don't. And he continues to kiss her, and he asks why. As he's asking why, he's kissing her again. And she says, because it's a sin. And he does it a good and he does it again. And she says, you're so good at it. It must be a sin. She likes it. But the idea that what she's doing is wrong and he's pushing it on her. Like all of that feels so messed up to me. And it reminds me of how conflicting it is. Being a young woman growing up in our community is very conflicting. Okay. So she says that she has to go and he makes her feel bad about having to go and you just force yourself on her. She's trying to get out of the situation and then you make her feel bad for trying to get out of it. And then she says, but I have to go in and do sister's hair. I promised her I would do her hair. I promise. Like, first of all, how dare you continue to kiss her when she said, stop, first of all. Second of all, how dare you make her feel bad for having to go and do something in this moment that doesn't include you. She was supposed to stop everything she was doing because you want to make out on the roof. Do y'all, you know what I'm saying? She was like, but I have to, you know, I, I promised her. I'm not lying. I promised. Like the energy of that. I didn't like that. You know what I'm saying? I feel like at, at some point, Sparkle is fighting against this energy and we're going to talk about it. And then her mom and everybody in the community tells her to stop fighting. And it just reminds me like of how when you see these things or feel that these interactions aren't really right, these interactions don't really feel good. You know what I'm saying? How, how you're being handled and whenever you fight against it and everybody else in your life is telling you to stop fighting it against it, even your mom. Like it, it, it's, it, it's, it's like, it's crazy. How as a woman do you ever fight for yourself when everybody's telling you that you shouldn't? It's crazy. Anyway, so sister goes on a date with Levi. This is another moment, y'all. This is another moment that I feel like, in essence, shaped a lot. And it's not just this moment. But these abusive interactions between men and women, I feel like, shaped the way I viewed, like, 
being sexy or sexy moments. It had to come with some type of aggression. And I think that's a that's a problem. <laughs> I think that's an issue. When y'all want to talk about black women choosing, you know, uh, gangster men or men having to be, you know, a certain type of aggression, y'all put this shit in our content. You put this in the things that we watched and shaped the way we viewed men. And then you blame us for how we grow up looking for a certain type of man because y'all in the car with her and Levi we're supposed to view Levi as somewhat of a good dude right Levi shows up in a car that doesn't belong to him she's suspicious she likes so you didn't stole his car huh and you know she got her sweater on her shoulders and she light skin with her pretty hair so it is given <laughs> you know what i'm saying it's given you know i'm too good for some foolishness type of thing but she gets in the car and he is rubbing her hair and grabbing her what we would like to call heavy petting back in the day okay and he asked you know he didn't got this nice call for her what else she want okay and she says and she says i want the big time you know why she wants the big time? Because she watched her mom struggle to take care of them. Ain't no daddy around. It's the mama working for them white people all day long and sister raising her two younger siblings. That's why she grew up so fast. Everybody wants to talk about how she's busting at the seams. It's because she had to help raise her little sisters. In this environment where the men are like this and the parents that are around have to work all the time so they don't have any time to be with the kids and back in the day i feel like you could blame white people because it felt like the white people make you work like this to take you away from us and now the 40 hour work week that everybody works now that was that came from that system of workers working for white people in their houses type of environment you know what I'm saying? That's why we have a 40 hour work week, I believe. I could be wrong, but I believe, you know, it goes back to them trying to make sure that they had assistance in their homes for the hours that they were awake as much as possible. Once all of, you know, they started making laws about working after slavery and reconstruction and all of that, right? So I feel like, you know, the kids could blame white people, but then like, I feel like as we got older, it didn't change. Like, now it's not about white people it's about having to make money period to survive so it's like a whole bunch of like layers to this movie that i feel like we still see now in our environments because essentially this is the this is a movie in the 70s based on the 50s and 60s and this woman is working her ass off raising her kids by herself where are the men? <laughs> where are the men, Jesus? Okay. Um, where are the men? The men are the young men predatory trying to make it in the, you know, area that they're in, but they're also taking advantage of the young women. So they're going to get the young women pregnant. Then they're going to end up in jail or dead or some shit <laughs> or, you know, whatever, you know, some of them might be there, but we saw where Levi ended up, you know? So, um, child for hour comes from factories. Okay. Okay. Child. Y'all know I think all of that be tied together. Factories is the same thing as slavery if you think about it. Just like the, the prison system. Like all of it is based off of the way they wanted people to work like slaves. We can't make y'all work like slaves. But, you know, <laughs> we gonna get as close to it as possible is what that felt like to me when you really think about it. But anyway, so like I'm saying, like he rubbing on her, kissing on her. And then y'all, he grabs her ponytail. She's chewing gum. So he pulls her ponytail, jacks her head back, grabs her face and says, open your mouth. Like, y'all, if a nigga did that to me, I probably would have punched him in the neck. Like. <laughs> no, Bondi, this is how when the men respected us. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, because you know how they love talking about, oh, back in the day, things were so much better. This man pulled this girl by her ponytail, jacked her head back, grabbed her face and told her to open her mouth and then proceeded to force his hand down her shirt. And then she says, wait a minute. 
and she pushes him off of her just so she can take the gum out of her mouth. As soon as she takes the gum out of her mouth, he slides her under him and climbs on top of her. And because she's giggling and laughing, everybody thinks this shit is cool. Like this is what the black girls want. Yes. It's giving assault. I would have bit his tongue. My uh, labor unions gave us the four-hour work week and weekends. Okay, right. Because they wanted us to be slaves before. <laughs> right, I feel you. Got it. So the labor unions was like, we're going to make it a little bit better. But essentially, you still give your life to the man. Um, why do I feel like their dad was also abusive to their mom? Her energy gave that. Her energy gave, you know, that someone, you know, was taking advantage of her softness because I think a lot of men did. You know what I'm saying? But yeah, y'all, that scene, when I watched that back, I was just like, and when I was a little girl watching it because I also saw that dynamic around me, you know, with women wanting to be with men that had all of this extra aggression. And when I tell y'all, because I feel like sometimes I don't recognize how New Orleans people have so much aggression until other people start to come here and I talk to them and they like, y'all like mad, like, you know, defensive and humbuggish. And I'm like, yeah, I know. <laughs> I know. You can't even look at a bitch without her feeling like you're trying to fight her. Dudes are mad humbuggish. Oh, you not receiving me hollering at you? Where will fuck you then? And all of this extra shit. The way they talk to people, the way they talk to women, there's no fragility in the way they handle people when it comes to how they talk. So when I was growing up, I saw a lot of this type of aggression. So imagine you're a little girl. This is your favorite movie. And the scene with the woman who you identify with, you know, as the star who you love, you know, is being manhandled by this man and she likes it. So how am I going to then go about receiving affection as I get older? You know what I'm saying? Like it, it, it defines us in some way and everybody acts like these type, this type of shit doesn't, but essentially it defines us at some point and what we accept and what we expect from men and what we find attractive and what looks like a man to you. You know what I'm saying? This type of toxic ass energy. So Dolores tells sister that she doesn't need to straighten her hair looking like a cracker because they in the kitchen and Dolores is, you know, cooking on the stove or washing dishes and Sparkle is straightening sister's hair. And the little chick that, you know, is from the neighborhood and from the church is sitting at the table, eating, giggling, listening to them talk. It's a real girls in the kitchen type moment, right? And Dolores is already on it. Why are you straightening your hair so you can look like them crackers? Already calling them crackers, yeah? Dolores also says, Mrs. Water says she saw Sparkle on the roof messing with sticks. Messing. <laughs> Say he was messing. Sparkle says, I was not. You was too. <laughs> and sister says, listen, ain't nothing wrong with messing around as long as the person you messing with goes down to the drugstore and take care of some business. Okay, don't come around here with no big belly talking about you ain't know what you was supposed to do. Now, mind you, baby, that's another one that defined me. Did you hear me? That's another line. I, I never forget that line. Don't you come around here with no big belly talking about you ain't know what you was supposed to do. Do you hear me? Okay. Me and sister was on the same page with that. <laughs> okay, and make sure a person, the person that you are messing with has a little, you know, extra money in their pocket. They can go down to the jeweler and buy you a little something nice. And then she shows them this diamond that Levi got her and Dolores clocks it again. Dolores is clocking shit all over the place. Like I said, child, uh, what she said, she laughs and says, Levi Brown hustles for nickels. Sharing somebody's small stone. Like, she might have low-key been hating on her, but essentially, she was letting her know, girl, like, <laughs> you're really excited about that little shit. And at the end of the day, he is hustling for nickels, okay? But that wasn't exactly the good thing to point out Dolores in this moment because at the end of the day, it made her strive for the next thing better than him was big time. But she always wanted big time. I don't even think she argued with her when she said that shit because she knew it was true. But yeah, <laughs> the diamond chip, real diamond chip. <laughs> Sharing somebody's small stone. <laughs> 
Child, I love me some Dolores, bro. They did make her seem like the angry one to fit the colorism stare. Yes, absolutely. But the, the older I get and the more I watched it, the more I related to her. I was like, she just see it and don't nobody else see it. Like whenever you are the angry one, it's always because you're awake. You see the shit and you're angry and everybody else wants you to just stay quiet about what you see. They see it too, but they don't want to see it. So, Stick shows up late to the record store that he works at. And he tells Smitty, the owner, that he had a dream about some numbers. And that's all niggas trying to do back in the day is hit the numbers, right? So, Smitty, like, tell me the numbers. And he like, I see you got, you know, a little radio contest going on for some tickets to this showcase. Won't you give me them four tickets to the, sh or the five tickets to the showcase? And he was like, you know, man, listen, that's for the record company. I ain't doing that. And then he like, well, I can't remember the numbers then. And so Smitty then, you know, gives him the tickets to go to the show. And so they go to the show, y'all. And this is like one of my favorite scenes, y'all. <laughs> Their performance was so performative. I took my troubles down to Madam Root. You know that gypsy with the gold tattoo. She's got a place down 34 and Vine. Selling little bottles of love potion number nine. <laughs> she said, I'm going to mix it up right here in the sink. It smelled like turpentine and looked like Indian ink. I swear to God, I broke my heart. I took a drink. I don't know the lyrics all the way. <laughs> I, I didn't know if it was day or night. Uh -uh. I started kissing everything in sight. But when I kissed a cop down 34 and Vine, he broke my little bottle of love, love potion number nine. That was the shit. And then the girls with the tambourines was killing it, okay? And I mean, uh -huh. he was hanging on the vision line. Uh -huh. They was getting it. <laughs> okay, when your girl started, go, Pim Daddy. Go, Pim Daddy. Go, go, go. Go, go, go. She's like, her vocals was incredible. Like, whoever. And she was bouncing all over the stage. So, sister was, like, really into it. And the last one, bruh. Da -dum, da -dum. Sin silly. Oh, you know how I love you. I'll do anything for you. That was the choreographer. You right. Please say you'll be mine. They was killing that. Oh, with the perm. Won't you tell me why I love that girl so? Please don't you want me? Oh, I never, 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 never sincerely had them hoes down, down stage losing their mind. Oh, you know how I love you. <laughs> he was killing that shit. But yeah, y'all know like that's that's what starts like the, the musical performances in this movie is like the shit. Okay. The one thing I have to say that they got perfect, but I also hate Catch-22. The lighting of the movie is so dark, but the actual movie is so dark too. So it, it matches, but it's one of the things that works on my nerves sometimes because you can't always see things as clearly as you would like to see it. But anyway, so when they walking home, sister is talking about how one of the girls was like, you know, bad. Did you see when she came up? And uh, you see that girl who came out to the front of the stage? She had all them people in there going crazy. And uh, uh, Sparkle says, well, you sing better than her any day. And Levi says, yeah, that's right. You sing better than her any day. And she says, well, at least she got a man that knows how to treat her, which is a slug at Levi. And Levi says, you do too. And sister says, yeah, but I bet she ain't got to take no train home. So trying to let you know that she's getting over small time. So she's pushing him to do more so that he can provide her with more. Her wanting more is pushing Levi to be big time, right? But the thing that aggravates me about this is why was there no other way for Levi to be big time? Because in essence, they make it seem like sister wanting 
you know, the big time wanting to do better is the reason why Levi ends up going to jail. When at the end of the day, as soon as she started fucking with Satin Struthers, there was no reason for him to be doing anything <laughs> for her. You know what I'm saying? Like, so in essence, I feel like everybody was just trying to make it out the ghetto. You know, even if they have their, their reasons for it. Sparkle, you don't want to live like your mom lived, you know. Uh, Sparkle and sister and them, they don't want to live like their mom lived. And Levi, Levi, we don't even know what his people are. We just know that he wants to be able to afford the type of girl he wants. And they just really don't have a lot of options back in the day, I guess. I mean, not I guess, I know, but still, like. It shit sucks, you know, for the longest it seemed like you, you just see so many people that, you know, hustle. If they had another way to get it, they could have got it that way too. But back in the day, it was like, you, you're going to play ball, you're going to be in music, you're going to sell drugs. Because if your people ain't got no money, you ain't going to nobody's school, you know? Anyway, y'all. So, Styx wants to talk to Levi about starting this group. Because that's how he going to get out. Sparkle says he and sister can do anything. Oh, and Levi too. Girl, she so, her head so gone over him. It's, a, it's annoying. It's annoying. But it just goes to show how a lot of times women are still pushing these men forward. And whatever it is that they want to do, you can do anything. You sound crazy telling him that. Like you sound like your head is gone over some good dick. But essentially... That's the place. You know what I'm saying? Like you either pushing them to do better or you're telling them that they can do better. But either way, you being some type of muse and inspiration for these niggas to get up off their knees. Okay. Um, so they start rehearsing. They start rehearsing. They're going to do their first showcase. And they in there rehearsing. Doo -doo 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 you know, doing their little rehearsal. And sister says, I know it. <laughs> like, I ain't got a rehearsal shoot. I know it. So when sister get up there and do her little thing and she show y'all she know it. Okay, listen. So the night of the show is some like titty dancers in there. You know, this is old school titty dancers. This is actually like burlesque. This is the type of shit that like I would like to do. Because it's like classy. They don't really take anything off. Um, well, you take stuff off, but you know, your nipples are covered. You're not showing, you know, any extra shit. It's more of a feather and a pretty and it, the movements aren't as, you know, ooh, look at my pussy. Like, no, it's kind of more of a, you know, hide and seek type of tease thing. And I like that. So this is what the girls are doing, but they doing it in this like rowdy, you know, drunk ass dark club. And this is something that if the white girls were doing it, they'd be doing it in a real nice club. You know what I'm saying? But it just shows like the showmanship of the girls back in the day. Like people was trying to find any avenue, <laughs> okay, to get out of these circumstances because them girls was on it. And they was twins. It was it was the cutest little thing. Yeah, shake dancers because that's what they do. They just come, they shake, but they got their little feathers and everything. It was cute. Anyway, but you know, back in the day, you looking at this like this is just so salacious. Nowadays, that's some good, clean fun. <laughs> Okay, so sister walks in dressed in a black dress. Everybody else has on red sweaters and uh, black pants, I believe. Um, but she got this red rose in her hair. You know, her hair, you know, swips off, you know, on, on one shoulder and all curly and beautiful and all of that. So sister is coming in with the energy, right? I'm, I'm about to kill this shit energy, okay? The hands are right here. I'm looking around the crowd, Okay, I see what's going on, but they're not ready for me. Okay, <laughs> like that's the vibe, okay? So everybody else looks like kids in comparison to her when they walk out on stage. But first, Doreen Baker, baby, that's a lovely name, okay? Doreen Baker said she was coming to sing Lucky Lips. When I tell y'all, me and my family laughed so hard about this damn scene for the longest. It's, it was years of us laughing at Miss Doreen doing Lucky Lips, okay? The MC told her, well, with a face like yours, you need something lucky on it, honey. Now, what type of nigga? You standing up there looking like a goddamn walrus and got the nerve to tell this lady she ugly on a microphone in front of all of these people and she took it on the chin too she was like you know her feelings was a little hurt and he was like oh i'm i'm you know i'm just playing i'm just playing okay he drunk messing up everybody's name but she got up there and sing when i was just a little girl with long and clinging curls my mama told me honey you got more than other girls you may not be good looking but you wear those diamond clips. 
Cause you will not have to worry. Cause you got lucky lips. Child, give it a hook. Get out of here. <laughs> okay, they give it a hook. They pull her off the stage. That shit was so funny. It was giving Sandman Sims, okay? And then the MC get up there, get up there, mess up their name. This is a new singing group called the farts. I mean, I mean the hearts. Like you you sabotaging people off rip. So they go out there and they do jump, you know. Mm -mm, mm, jump, mm -mm, mm, jump, 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 jump. A boy don't get shaky. Mm -mm. Don't be mad and get flaky. Do 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 cause there's things you don't know. Oh, mm -mm -mm. let mama show you how it goes. Do 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 spread your feet out. <clears throat> Move your hands all about. Men over, big rover. We're gonna turn the place out. <clears throat> and now you jump, jump. We're gonna shake a little funky, doing fine. And now you're right on time, ever ball now. I hope my mama don't call the rule. We're gonna keep it in the groove. Hey, baby, you're all for me. Cause you're moving, just setting me free. I love the way you party hard. Don't want nothing to tear us apart. Tell you now, I ain't too proud to bet it. Hold my partner, love to shake a leg. It's one thing I need to know. If you love me, baby, tell me so. And now you jump, jump. We're gonna shake a little funky, do it fine. Listen, she killed that performance. When sis, you know, stepped out and put the hand up and did the little wiggle with the hand and then turned around and went back into the choreography with them. <laughs> My mama don't go through. We're gonna keep it in the group and jump and jump, jump. She went down and gave him the little shimmy or whatever. Okay, listen, I'm gonna do what the, the titty sisters did, <laughs> but I'm gonna sing too, bitch. I hope my mama. Okay, listen. Okay, sister killed the performance. Everybody walks off stage. Sister stays out there. <laughs> and the men is coming up on the stage. And Levi had to come and yank her ass. That shit was too funny, y'all. He didn't have to yank her like that. <laughs> he didn't have to yank her like that. But they won the competition, y'all. And Styx wants to take the money and put it into the group. And then he and Sparkle have sex on the roof for the first time. And he kissed her and hit her with that sweet, sweet baby. And it was a whole situation, child. After that, it was over. Okay, no more version for Sparkle. <clears throat> okay. So, Levi. Levi go and meet with Satin Struthers. See, I, I can't stand it, y'all. But I actually feel like Tony King, the actor that plays Satin Struthers... <laughs> She said the biggest crush on him when I was growing up from this movie. But then also he played in another movie. <clears throat> what was it? Uh, um, something of Harlem. Something of Harlem. I'm forgetting the movie. But they used to have all this, this song that they would play all the time. Big Papa. But anyway, he was like the second in command to like a, a drug lord on this movie or something like that. And he always had these fly ass, you know what I'm saying? White fits on. The hair was percolating and the facial hair is beautiful and all that. Then my mom also told me that she met him one time. Um, I think it might have been at Jazz Fest or something like that. Or uh, something, something that her and my dad went to and she was talking to him and my dad was feeling <laughs> But I always felt like he was just such a, a good looking man, especially in this movie. Terrible person. But like his, his, you know, skin tone and the suits and everything. Like I get why sister was so into him. And like that's another part of the problem. <laughs> Rage in Harlem. Thank you. It was Rage in Harlem. Thank you. Um, so hold on. I'm going to get to these uh, super chats in a second. Thank y'all. So yes, Levi... Oh, uh, was it hell in Harlem? I think it was hell up in Harlem. 
It was hell up in Harlem. That's the one it was. Because it's not Rage in Harlem. That was another one. That was like the uh, <clears throat> the club situation. Um, right? Like a Rage in Harlem was the one that was the, the girls that worked at the club. And hell up in Harlem is the one that I'm talking about from like the 70s. But anyway, so Levi Meese was sat in Struthers in this cockfight. And they betting 10 bucks on some chickens. And, you know, Levi said, you know, oh, put five in for me too. You know, he's trying to get in good with somebody that's perceived as a kingpin. Okay? <clears throat> so hold up. Let me read these super chats. And then we'll continue on. But yeah, y'all. Yes, make sure everybody, make sure y'all like the video. Make sure you subscribe to my channel. Okay, Road to 100K, love. And also, it's my birthday month. I make 35 on May 26, so that's what this is about. So, thank you. Random V, thank you for the super chat. I appreciate it so much. And thank you, Jalen Fulton, for the super chat. Just sending you some love. It is greatly appreciated. Thank y'all so much. So, let's go ahead and continue on. So, Sparkle helps Effie get comfortable after work help her mama take her shoes off and all of that and this reminds me of me because I, I had this type of relationship with my mom where <clears throat> you know you want to be the helpful one you want to be the one that makes everybody's life easier you know what I'm saying so yeah I knew Rage in Harlem was like a 90s movie and hell up in Harlem was in the 70s but yeah so I recognize Sparkle's personality as the one always trying to be of help and she talks about how it seems like ever since they did that talent show, everybody has, you know, somewhere to go and, you know, something to do all of the time. Um, she says they've been rehearsing a lot and sister and sticks fight something awful. <clears throat> so we know it's Sparkle feeling torn between her sister and sticks even now. So ever since they won the contest, everyone's busy all the time. Effie says that she doesn't see sticks around at night anymore. And Sparkle says that he's trying to get them into clubs and stuff. So he's just been real busy with that. Levi and Sticks are going around to different clubs trying to get their group in, but nobody wants to see a group with men in it. They want to see women or single acts. So, and also Levi wants to work with Satin. He doesn't want to do the group thing anyway. He was like, I wasn't nothing but a backup singer, no way. So they go in to the club with a dark skinned black man with his lily white old lady at the bar with her poodle. Like the, 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 the picture of that. Like the black man that owns a business in the black neighborhood has a white woman sitting at the bar with him. Like that was also very like, what the fuck? You know what I'm saying? Like everybody around is struggling to make it. And you go and get the white girl and bring her into, you know, the club in the hood. You know what I'm saying? Like it's just something about it. And it's not the hood. You could tell this is like a a nicer club but it's still in Harlem it's still around their neighborhood and it just kind of feel like this is an example of how when these men had a little bit of something they weren't trying to share it with the black women in their community anyway he doesn't want the group with men but he'll let this the three sisters perform especially after Levi takes the picture of sparkle I mean of sister out of his wallet and says they call well Levi takes the picture out and, you know, she sings so sweet, you know, and she's so fine, you know. And then Stick says they call her the ugly one, which we know isn't true. But I always remember that, too. Yeah, they call her the ugly one. Like, out of the sisters, there's an ugly one, child. Because after that, I, you know, I will refer to myself as the ugly one. Not neither of us are ugly, <laughs> to be clear, okay? Um, but... You know, when you're the baby sister, you always look at your older sister as, you know, look you look up to. So you don't feel like you're on the same level because you look up to them. So anyway, they perform Hooked on Your Love, y'all. <sighs> Child, hold on. Let me see if I can do it. Your tender smile gives me happy thoughts of you. You got me so close to my dreams, now they have to come true. Ooh, baby, nothing to be shy about. Nothing we've got to lie about. Hope loving you don't confuse you. Ooh, baby, baby, I don't want to lose you. And when we touch, 
our hearts move in a steady pace. Ooh, ooh, yeah. I'm trying hard not to show the blushing over my face. Ooh, baby, you bring out the woman in me. What can I say that you can't see? I like the way we carry on. Ooh, hope you understand my feelings. Got me just the real end. What can I do <clears throat> with this feeling? Look on your love, sweet love, love. What can I do? What can I do? <clears throat> With this feeling, look on your love, sweet love, love. Your heart's within me, they send me just to staring me down. Ooh, ooh, yeah. I'm so turned on and time it, child, I got to move around. Over and over, you astound me. I take pleasure to have you around me. My loving arms would love to squeeze you. Oh, baby, take it. I don't want to tease you. What can I do <clears throat> with this feeling? Hooked on your love, sweet love, love. I'm trying not to do the whole thing. <laughs> Ooh, nothing to be shy about. Nothing we got to lie about. Hope loving you don't confuse you. Ooh, baby, take it. I don't want to tease you. Try that line right there, here. Yeah? <laughs> Listen, I ain't, about to, I ain't about to do the whole thing because I got to get a wax, okay? And I'm self-conscious, okay? <laughs> Cause I gotta do it. I gotta get a wax. I know, but you know you mean. Y'all know I know the choreography down down pat. So they perform hooked on your love and sadness in the audience glued in the whole time, like like just enamored, right? So after everybody goes to their dressing room to congratulate them. Stick says the club owner wants to sign them on and have them perform, you know, every week. They're excited. You know what I'm saying? We did it. We did it. <laughs> you know, all of that. And then here comes Satin Struthers and his old lady and Levi. Levi is working with him now. So Levi comes to introduce them to the group, right? And Satin invites Sister to the party that they're going to. And his woman says she's going to the party with us. And so Satin says, excuse me for a second, please. Um, but you know, it was an excellent performance. Steps into the hallway, punches his old lady in the stomach, and takes her, her fur coat from her. And to me, it always seemed like Levi was like, come on, man. Like, give her her coat. Like, you didn't punch her in her stomach and told her she needs to go. And now you're trying to take the fur coat from her. But when I watched it this time, Lyric was like, nah. He told him to take the coat because he wanted to keep the coat, okay? Because later on, we hear about this coat because he gave sister a coat. And, you know, it's a whole situation, y'all. But he punched that lady in the stomach. Now, to me, this is what sister fucked up. Sister grows up in survival mode. So instead of recognizing that if this man will punch that lady in the stomach and toss her to the side just because he saw me, He'll do that to another woman, but she don't think like that. She think I need to get in where I fit in and he big time. And if he going to kick us to the curb for me, then I'm going to take the spot because I'm trying to get up out of here. But that shit was messed up. And he should like, she shouldn't have never wanted to fuck with him after that. Like that was crazy as hell to me. So sticks and sparkle go to a hotel because it's getting too cold to make love on the roof now. So they go and lie and <clears throat> bribe the guy at the hotel but honestly y'all like this is why y'all don't need to be asking people questions all the time because essentially you were just gonna be bribed anyway to let this underage girl go upstairs to this hotel with this grown man and have sex with him you know but we gonna we gonna let it slide you know what i'm saying because 
they was already fucking. <laughs> they was about to be together. It was a three-year difference. We're going to leave it alone. But when they went to the hotel, you know, he had to bribe the guy because the guy is asking his age and her age and where's the marriage license and all of this shit. And I'm just kind of like, you was going to get bribed anyway. So what she was asking all of them questions for? Shout out some old school shit if I ever seen it. Anyway... Okay, she go upstairs to the hotel room. She all excited. Look, cash me a bouquet soap. Like, girl. <laughs> but I get it. I ain't even gonna lie. Child, when you first start screwing and then y'all go and y'all start like screwing in hotels and shit like that, you be feeling real classy based, bitch. <laughs> okay, ain't nobody fucking in their people in their people house getting caught and all of that shit. Mm -mm. We gonna get this hotel room. Okay? So Levi goes over to satin's house and sister is coming towards the bedroom door to close it and i don't know if he knew that she was fucking with him yet but he saw it and he instantly kind of got upset but he didn't act like he was upset about her being there and it seemed like she already had a black eye that was another thing i noticed i was like it looked like she already got a black eye like this is the beginning of the relationship but you already getting beat up Stick says he's not making any money. He's got big plans for the future and he needs big dough. He's ready and Satin knows it. Satin says, let me decide when you're ready. And it was just kind of like, that's bullshit. Satin, I believe, knew that Levi's goal was to get on, blow up so he can get sister back. It wasn't so that, you know, he really still loved her. Like no matter what, he loved her and it was going to always be in his mind to try to gain shit so that he could get her. So he was going to have to be bigger than Satin in order for that to happen. And Satin wasn't going to let that happen. So to me personally, I feel like Satin knew that somebody had dropped a dime and he let that shit happen the way it did anyway, because I think he wanted to get Levi out of the way. Now that I look at it, because this moment right here, let me know that you was purposefully like holding him back because y'all having a pissing contest over sister. So Effie and Miss Waters come down to the club to see the girls perform and they didn't have any seats left and they had a table saved for satin. So Sticks is like, we gonna have them share a table. Maybe share a reefer with Miss Waters. <laughs> that shit was so funny. Maybe ask for sister's hand. Maybe share a reefer with Miss Waters. Like y'all, Miss Waters be on the roof smoking reefer. That's why. <laughs> that's why she know everybody business. So sister gets backstage, and Sparkle is talking about Sticks was saying they should, you know, go and uh, go and start working on a demo for the record label, trying to get a record uh, a record deal. When sister takes her hat off, y'all, she had this real beautiful floppy hat on, and when she took the hat off, they see her black eye. And Dolores says, sister, and grabs her face. And she says, you gonna let that nigga kill you? Dolores and Sparkle are both shocked. Dolores says she had an accident on the brain when she started running around with that no good, low life trash. Everybody could see that Satin wasn't shit but her. Sister tells Dolores, well, if she don't like it, she can get out of her dressing room. And she said, look, listen here, this is my dressing room too. She said, this is my dressing room too. And I said, get out. She didn't just kick her out because she said something about satin. She kicked her out because she wanted to do the cocaine and she didn't want to do it in front of Dolores. Because not only was Dolores going to tell, but she knew Dolores would judge her because Dolores judges her for everything that she does. So, she brings out the cocaine and Dolores went outside and she was crying. And one of Satin's henchmen who sweet on her was like, you know, you look good. And she was like, leave me alone. But remember this moment because this nigga like her and she's going to use that to her advantage at one point. Right. So I felt so bad for Dolores because Dolores was the only one that, yeah, that had common sense that could see what was going on, that cared enough, that was strong enough and... It was like nobody was paying attention and nobody saw it and nobody appreciated it. They just felt like she was a nuisance because she was always going to be the one, you know, telling them right when they wanted to do wrong. So when she brought out the coat, she tells Sparkle because she knows Sparkle is like, what is going on? But she relies on Sparkle being young and green. Dolores might be young, but she ain't green. So 
she starts, you know, cutting the coke up. And she says, you know, sister can't fly on one wing. Y'all, that was the line right there. That was the line right there. Sister can't fly on one wing. And it's like, well, bitch, if you would stop letting that nigga break your other wing, you wouldn't need cocaine to fly. Okay? But y'all, at the time, Sparkle didn't have the wherewithal, the strength. You know, she didn't know. All she knew is it's her big sister. She followed behind her. So if sister is doing this, then I'm, I'm just going to help her do whatever she want to do. I'm going to protect her. I'm not going to tell her she should stop or tell mommy what's going on because then I would betray her. So I understand the mindset, but it was one of someone too young to really understand what was happening in that moment. Mrs. Waters says, I heard a lot about you, Satin. And he says, likewise. And I thought that was hilarious. I was like, what you heard about Ms. Waters? <laughs> then they perform giving him something he can feel, y'all. Okay. So my favorite thing about this performance was her shoulder. Like, Many say that I'm too young to let you know just where I'm coming from, but you will see. It's just a matter of time. My love will surely make you mine. Well, I'm living in a world of ghetto life. Everyone seems so uptight, but nothing's wrong and it's all right with my man. I like the way we carry on his love and wasting me on and on with my man. And people out there can understand I'm giving him something he can feel. To let him know this love is real. Well, I'm giving him something. Then he can feel to let him know this love is real. This love is real. So much joy for us, it seems. So much hope for material things. Is it only in my dreams? Okay. Y'all got to do my background. That's exactly why I'm singing this song to you. To prove that real dreams do come true. You tell me what does it mean. Okay, now you got to get back into it. Because we're theatrical. <laughs> Living in a world of ghetto life. Everyone seems so uptight. But nothing's wrong and it's alright with my man. I like the way we carry on his love and wasted me on and on. My man and people out there can understand I'm giving him something he can feel. Okay, to let him know this love is real. Well, I'm giving him something he can feel. To let him know this love is real. And you know they just gotta keep giving him something he and killing that shit. Okay, shoulders. Oh, 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 oh. Singing the backgrounds, okay? Tow the house down, okay? But while they were performing, we were seeing things happening. We were seeing um Dolores messing up choreography. <laughs> Looking, we've been doing the same hand movement the whole time, Dolores. Why you don't have this yet? Okay? I'm sorry, y'all. Dolores was always, Dolores wasn't supposed to be in the group. Okay? Because Dolores couldn't get the hand movements. Okay? Come on, Dolores. Get out of here. So, sister left the house. Sister packed her little hard box luggage. 
you know, with her cat suit body, you know, uh, pants on with a tight shirt, looking good, hair swift to the side, and when got in her man's nice old school caddy with, with his, uh, what it was, peanut butter insides? Either way, the car was nice. That nigga had his suit and his hat on coming to pick her up, bitch. Listen, besides getting her ass beat, she was out here living her best life. Okay? Effie and Mrs. Walters go to tell the girls how great they were. And sister asks if Effie saw the crowd going crazy for him. And she says, yeah. And then um, Sticks asks for Miss Walters to go outside and give him a moment because everybody can see when they're looking at her now, they can see her face. And as she's, you know, taking the makeup, I say theatrical makeup is terrible for my face, mama. Like trying to make excuses for what's going on with her face. Effie says, sister, he's just going to drag you to the gutter with him. And she says, gutter? Y'all know y'all heard me do this before. Gutter, what do you mean? He's as big time as you can get. I've lived in Harlem all my life. I do know a rat when I see one. You don't understand, mama. You don't understand. Well, I've said my piece. And now I'm going to go home. <laughs> like, and just left it at that. And Sparkle was so upset because... She know what that meant. That meant that that's why old boy came and got her bag, you know, came and picked her up. I don't even think it was that she wanted to leave. But to me, that was the line in the sand. That was her mama telling her, this man ain't good for you. You're going to keep messing with him. You know what you're going to have to do, which means you're going to have to go all in. Get out of my house. Go ahead. <laughs> go ahead. You want to be grown? Be grown. So that's what I think was happening in this moment. Y'all know how old school people are. I said my piece and that's it. I ain't got nothing else to say. You want to be grown? Go out there and be grown. Okay? And that's what sister did. So Effie, and this is what the mamas did. You act calm and like you're in control in front of everybody. But when you go to work, it's eating you up. Eating you up that your daughter is out here running her life behind this man. Right? So she gets to work and Mrs. Gerber, the white lady that she works for, asks her if anything's wrong and says that, you know, she would hope that if anything was wrong, she would consider her enough of a friend to confide in her. I'm like, you're a bored housewife that wants to know what's going on with the Negro woman that's cleaning your bathrooms. And not only was she white, they were Italian. Like sisters, people worked for the Italians, as they like to call them back in the day. It was given mob. Okay, and we didn't realize this until, you know, this moment. This was also speaking to the fact that the music industry is full of gangsters because originally the music industry was funded by the mob. A lot of record companies, the deals that they, you know, brokered were was like to clean money and to uh, make enterprise with drug money and all of that type of shit. So, like, in essence, the entertainment industry because, you know, that y'all always want to talk about why the music industry is so polluted with predators and all of that type of shit. It's because in its infancy, when it was being created as an industry in the, you know, 40s, 50s, 60s, all of these years, it was being funded by criminals. So, yeah. <laughs> now that we get here to the Gerber's house and, yeah, they're the good white people, but they're also the good white people that are probably criminals. Okay? So... Satin, Satin and sister are laying in the bed and he says, you didn't thank me for your fur coat. Now, they're in fragrante delicto, meaning that they just finished fucking. So what do you mean? She says, oh, yes, I did. I thanked you in every way I could, baby. And he says, I want you to crawl for me. And this is that demeaning shit that I got to break you down even in your moments of, you know, reprieve. Like we just finished having sex. She's completely completely vulnerable in this moment right laying on his chest thinking everything's good and he tells her to crawl and because she still is a woman that has some type of self-esteem about herself sister still sister she laughed him off and he hopped on top of her and started punching her and the thing that i hated about it is that you could hear it crawl bitch crawl 
Also, Tyler Perry, we know that you made, you know, them people watch Sparkle for the ashtray bitch. Like, the, 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 crawl, bitch, crawl, ashtray bitch. Same thing. Same thing. Tyler Perry's always playing odes to old black movies in small ways. And this is just one of those moments that I recognize. He can't tell me no different. So, when Sister gets to the club for the next performance, we didn't even see this performance, y'all. Because at this point, it is out of hand, Okay. So she gets to the club. The Lord sees her face and asks, she's like, sister, you gonna let that nigga kill you? And sister says, it ain't nothing a little makeup can't cover. The Lord says, what else is that nigga pushing inside of you besides his fist? Because now we noticing, you know, you ain't on your shit the way you supposed to be. Sister says, leave me alone. Why don't you get out of here? And the Lord says, no, not this time. Because now the Lord sees what's going on. Sparkle comes in with a bag and the Lord says what is that and sister hurry up and grabbed it they kind of fight over it for a moment give it to me give it to me falls on the ground block of coke and the Lord looks at her like just so hurt and confused like what are you doing like and sister was so ashamed like the way she give it to me and she falls on the floor and she's ashamed. Like Dolores, you know, it is a is a you know high integrity, right? So like she was ashamed and she starts to cry and and Sparkle just hugs her. Sparkle just hugs her. But this is the moment where it's like Dolores feels like she has to do something. She has to do something. So she goes outside and sees Satin's, you know, goofy ass right hand man that likes her. And she, you know, he asked her what she doing later. And she said, I'm freeze the breeze. And so she sleeps with him. I don't know how old this girl is, but they went to a hotel and she fucked him for information. And then when he was asleep, she said she was going to buy some cigarettes and she went down to the payphone and gave the police a tip on Satin making a drop. And when the police showed up, it wasn't Satin, it was Levi. Levi ran. The police back in the day would just shoot you. So they shot him, shot him in the leg, arrested him. Levi, we don't know how long he was going to spend in jail, but he spent the rest of this movie in jail. Okay, and this was another thing that they changed in the second movie that I was appreciative of. I mean, you know, they didn't have to turn the Maury Hardwick into, a, you know, a fucking incel on some slick shit. <laughs> like, nigga, you that upset still? Okay, but, you know, Levi was never mad at his sister. You know what I'm saying? Levi was never mad at her, and that's what made it so sad. He went to jail, and for the rest of the movie, we would see him sitting in his cell looking at pictures of her, you know, listening to sparkle on the radio like still missing and and you know loving the the kids and the people he grew up with even though he was in jail now so I feel like there was definitely like a heartbreak there but back in the day they used to always I think try to you know get you to not be involved in street life through some of these movies but I don't know if people weren't getting it. Like, I don't know what the fuck was going on. But this was one of those movies trying to tell you not to get involved in street life. You know, don't get involved in drugs. That's what it was trying to teach you. But you know, oppression, oppression is oppression. You can only do so much. But Styx gets Levi a lawyer. And Satin runs up on sticks in the alleyway thinking that he dropped a dime on him. So he pulled a knife on him and Satin is the only one that knew Levi was going to make that run. They fight and Sticks beats his ass and tells him, you've been beating up on women too long. <laughs> okay. He was like, the men you do business with, they going to mess you up. And then they going to have you in the gutter with the rest of this shit. I didn't drop a dime on you, but I wish I had. I was just like, child, that was one of the best parts of the movie. When Satin got his ass beat by a man. <laughs> You've been beating up on women too long. But you know what make me mad? It, 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 
Because I understand why they stayed out of it. Sister was so strong-willed. I don't think there was anything that anybody could have done to, you know, to stop that from happening. But it would have been nice, if, you know, if as soon as she popped up with a black eye, you know, some of the homeboys would have went and fucked him up. That would have been nice. But, you know, that didn't happen. So Dolores decides that because when she tried to help, it only made the situation worse. She decided to leave. I also think she left out of fear that they would eventually find out it was her. Um, and Effie tells her that any problems that she has, she's taken with her in that suitcase. And Dolores tells her mom, mom, there's shit now that we never even thought of before. Education and technology that we never even thought of before. Okay. She says, we don't have to live off what the white man gives us. We don't have to be driving their cars and shining their shoes and being a, and she says, say it being a maid and then Dolores says yeah mama being a maid Dolores says that she has seen her get up in the middle of the night to ride the subway for two hours to get to their house and to do their cooking and their cleaning and their ironing and clean the shit out of their toilets and for what for what mama and this is the moment right here y'all because everybody will say to take care of y'all, to take care of y'all. But I think what Dolores is saying is in the grand scheme of things, you did it to take care of us and we still struggling and we still don't have anything. You worked so hard and were so loyal to them white people and that got us nowhere, essentially. The idea that being the good Negro still doesn't get us where we want to be or where we, where we need to be. You know what I'm saying? And that's why it's so funny when you hop forward to our time and we having these conversations like what Ebony K. Williams was saying about, you know, us being permanent second class because of these ideals that, you know, the bare minimum or a little bit is enough. Uh, you know what I'm saying? Like, and, and ownership being important in order for us to get out of constantly being in these spaces of being um easy targets you know what i'm saying so when she was saying for what that's what i think about when you know what i'm saying i think about the shit that ebony k williams and all of them are talking about when they say own stuff and and you know own businesses instead of just working for other people because that's an easier thing to do it's about providing um you know providing more in a community for people so that they can not only have you know so much to, to work with when they're trying to do more with their lives besides music, playing ball and selling drugs. Like what are the other options? But if you don't see anybody doing those things, you know what I'm saying? How do you know you can do them? And so this is what Dolores is talking about. Everybody around her is like, girl, just keep doing what we've been doing because we just need to get by. And Dolores is like, I want to do more than get by. And we never see her again after this. But essentially, I mean, you know, she didn't even come back for the fume. But to me, I feel like she goes somewhere else and gets involved in the Black Panther Party or some shit. Like, you know what I'm saying? She she goes and does that. You could feel, you know, that that's where her mind was going in the, the evolution and the, advance, the advancement of black people. You know, there's a moment in time where everybody's working their asses off and getting nowhere. And so that's where we had to go into this. We have to fight for some type of advancement in this system because we're here and we're not going to just be cleaning and cooking and, and, you know, tying shoes and shit for white people forever. We need to get up out of that. So that's where you get the energy of the 60s and the 70s um, where people were fighting for the advancement of black people. And I think y'all, when I'm, I've just watched like the last recent episode of the Dear Mama documentary, y'all putting the Black Panther Party and what they were trying to do and how the FBI and all of those people really fought, they fought so hard to demolish that. And I feel like a part of demolishing that was also having to integrate us into their society in the way to make us complacent, but not to make us strong enough, smart enough to topple them. So a lot of the, the systems that we're in right now, a lot of the way we live our lives right now, um, 
it feels better than what was happening back then, but it's only because they realized if it didn't get better, if we didn't see ourselves on TV, if we didn't see ourselves doing these things that we see white people do, we were going to keep fighting to get there. So they had to give something, but they also find all of these other fucked up ways to fuck over you. You know what I'm saying? All these sneaky ways under the laws and all of that. And then now the music industry, the music that's promoted promotes you not to be smart, for you to be stupid, like for you not to be educated. And it's crazy how that happens. Like watching Tupac's evolution is like the perfect example of how whenever you are smart and, you know, revolutionary and you for you're a good person and you are loud and you want these things, you want to to have better for us. You're going to get fucked on both ends. The people that don't want you to have this advancement are going to try to stop you. And the people in your community are going to try to stop you because they feel like what you want is more than they're willing to do. So they're going to try to stop you too. So it's crazy. I remember the, the, the biggest thing I remember in this last episode was a finish accord telling Tupac, do not sacrifice yourself for black people. Because they will let you sacrifice yourself and they won't give you anything in return. Because she did it. And, but I was just like, but they, it's not even like nobody's there to come and save you. You know what I'm saying? Like nobody's there to come and save you. That's why you got to save yourself. That's how we got this, this, this alpha self thing. Because yes, counter pull. Yes. This. Everyone, please look up Pro and the Jezebel trope against black women. Y'all, it's a lot of demonic, like, and when this is what I mean, demonic, demonic is like y'all set out to infiltrate all of these different spaces to corrupt the way black people think about themselves and to corrupt how they feel about each other so that their community will never topple yours. And so everybody doesn't, like, see it or recognize it, like a lot of the manipulation that goes on. That's why, like, when we be on social media now, I be paying attention to your spiritual word and your shade room posts and how a lot of it promotes men and women, especially black men and women, fighting with each other. It promotes that. It promotes you to only care about yourself. The post where the, the man is talking about giving the kids up because he found out that the woman was cheating and the kids weren't his. Tupac said, we have to take care of all the kids because that's why everybody's going crazy because nobody wants to be responsible for kids that aren't theirs. But this is the community. So if you're not responsible for all the kids, the kids that don't have anyone to lean on are going to turn into people angry in and with the community. That's exactly what happened. So when we have these conversations, and I say that people should care more about their kids than whoever the adult is that they're angry with and everybody in the comments wants to tell me that a person doesn't have to do that and she's this and she's that it doesn't matter what about the fucking kids suck it up that's the mindset though you see what I'm saying so it, it, it's a mindset to be selfish it's a mindset to, to say fuck everybody but yourself and only be out for self like but it's something that has been like put into us injected into our community like drugs hate each other you know don't want to be smart it's too hard you know what i'm saying rather work for somebody else than have your own business it's too hard like you know if you like the shit right y'all like the stuff that Tupac and them were actually trying to like promote and talk about before everything, you know, goes into the, the downward spiral. It's crazy how you see that same thing repeated over and over again. I feel like Tupac might have been the last that I recognize um, as somebody that was a revolutionary that I feel like was purposefully stomped out like purposefully, like with the recognition that this is a person that can possibly topple this environment that we've created to keep people in these, you know, the, these fucked up spaces. They're oppressed, they're depressed, and so they'll keep drugging and trying to do things just to make it, and then we can keep putting them in jail and having them work these menial jobs. Therefore, they can continue making us rich and giving us the slavery that we set for this country to be based on. But we have to keep fucking with you in all of these other areas to cause you to crack. Because if we cause you to crack, then we cause you to crack. And what's going to happen when people crack? You either dead, you in jail, 
or you in some type of dead end job situation or you are a menace in the community. So then you also hurt the community by that way. It's, it's crazy. I knew somebody was going to say Nipsey. I just don't know. You know, I, I didn't have that experience with him in that same way. Um, as far as like that universal world type vibe. Like when I think about Tupac, I do think about Malcolm X. Like, I, you know what I'm saying? Like that world thing. Um, Nip was definitely on his way. But yeah, no, I, I definitely feel like it's it's purposeful when it comes to certain things. But also recognize that it's also been put into this community to be crabs in a barrel and not want each other to succeed because of fear of being left behind. So rather destroy than to have any of us make it out. Is a, is a mentality that a lot of us have as well. So sometimes it doesn't even have to be outside of ourselves. It can be inside of us because everything has already been injected into the community. And Sparkle is like one of the perfect movies that shows you like, you know, the beginning like of a lot of this detriment in our community. Because everybody likes to use this time period like black family was so prevalent in the 50s and 60s and shit. It's like it was more of the norm, but it was also more of the norm for everybody. And now in this time frame, I think we like to ignore the fact that for everybody, this whole nuclear family thing is not the thing for most people in American society. Like it's not just us. <laughs> it's not just us. Um, but anyway, um, we see Effie serving dinner for the Gerbers and they're toasting to American enterprise. And this is when I'm like, even I'm gluing in even more to the fact that, okay, so this is speaking on the mob American enterprise. This is the, you know, the people who, because they have the, the, you know, the, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? The, I'm thinking, I can't think of the words, y'all. Why am I spacing? Y'all know the complexion for protection. Thank you. Come on, mind. Help me. So because the Italians can come here and get involved in business in a certain way, like they had to fight for their whiteness, but they were able to obtain their whiteness in this country. So they kind of had the cornerstone on mob. Mob gets into entertainment business because entertainment business wasn't something that was could be traced exactly in the same way as other business like bank and, and um um you know a uh, farming and and uh manufacturing all of those things have more checks and balances right entertainment industry doesn't have as many checks and balances so it can be ran by a whole bunch of fucked up ass people so i feel like curtis mayfield all the people involved in this movie they're saying so many different things about what the experience was of black people but this is another one so you're trying to get out of your dire straits right you get to the next level of this to where we're now going to try to get record deals and all of this type of shit and we're gonna now have to deal with another set of gangsters first we dealing with the gangsters at home then once we get past the gangsters at home we dealing with the gangsters out in the enterprise in the world so uh gerber is jewish it was either italian or jewish but it was given mob it was given working with the mob because i remember talking about the matzo balls but it both is the same to me. To me, it's the same. Like y'all came here, y'all earn your whiteness. Like <laughs> you earn your whiteness and you know, you infiltrate. But y'all remember this dinner? Like the dinner was with Italians. I thought they were because of that dinner, but it always came off like they were, you know, Jewish mob exists. Okay. But I'm just saying the way they were talking, the the accent of the way they were talking, Mo and you know, when is it Mo and Lee? You're the tops. Like it was the way they were talking that sounded very like Italian to me. The way Italian Americans in entertainment can speak. Um, but yeah, Jewish, Italian, same difference. Y'all know they both, um, you know, run the entertainment industry in one way or another. Um, only because Italy was about to go to war with the U.S. Aha. Yes, yes, yes. Masa is Jewish. Yes. And that's what I, yes. That's what I thought. When I heard him say matzo balls, I thought that was Jewish. But when I heard them talking at the table, I was like, is it Italian? And then I'm, I'm like, this is, you know, as the movie goes on, you're like, it's giving mob. And so that's why I was like, they must, you know, be saying that, you know, it's the Italian mob or some shit. Because that was really big during that time in this area. They're in Harlem. They're in New York. Like, the mob was Italian at this time, if I'm sure. 
the purple gang was a Jewish mob. Okay, so this was a Jewish mob, not the Italian mob. It was somebody's mob, y'all. <laughs> somebody's mob, okay? But what we're saying is the point of it, whatever, whatever ethnicity, it was the ethnicity of people that are in some type of, you know, criminal enterprise. So the club owner tells Sticks that he will give them one week because Sister has been missing a lot of performances and he has to pre replace Dolores. And they get one of the girls from the church, you know, the one who was always hanging around to come in and perform in Dolores's place. But Sister doesn't show up. Sticks blows up on the piano, runs off. Spark I mean, he looked like he knocked Sparkle down when he, you know, ran out. She runs after him, you know, and she's like, Sticks, wait. He's like, I work my ass off and nobody gives a damn. You know what I'm saying? And he's running his mouth about how would he ever do for Sister would try to make a special. It's like Sister was already special, nigga. You was trying to capitalize off her being special. Let's be very clear. You were drawn to all of those women because you recognized that they were special, that they had talent, and that you could possibly use them to get where you wanted to go. You were definitely doing that with Sparkle. So I, I'm looking at Sticks right now. Like, that's very, that's very, you know, cute of you to say that. When really, yes, you might have been helping and pushing them along, but you recognized that they were some, you know, that they were people that you could take advantage of in that situation, especially Sparkle. Um, so he asked her to come with him. He was like, you can come with me. And she was like, listen, I can't leave my mom and sister behind. Like nobody cares about sister anymore. And he says, well, you can stay then because this wasn't about her. It was never about her. And that's the thing for me. Sticks could do shit and not even really be thinking about Sparkle like that. But as long as Sparkle was running behind him, everybody thought that shit was cool. Okay. And he ends up just leaving her. Like, fuck her. And her mom is going to tell her that a man's got to do what a man's got to do. And I'm like, yeah, that's true and everything. You got to let somebody go get their shit together. But at the same time, he didn't give a fuck about how Sparkle felt a lot of the time. Like, a lot of the time, it was not about Sparkle. It was about him getting where he wanted to go. And she was pushing him and helping him get there. And as soon as Sister and Sparkle were no longer of use to him in that moment, he was tired and he wanted to go. And to me, that showed that it wasn't really about them. It wasn't really about having a relationship with Sparkle. It was about getting on. And when you felt like you couldn't get on... Now you want to kill somebody and now you're going to leave and go work in construction. Okay. So y'all, then the last song that sister sang, y'all. And this right here was done by um, Donnie Hathaway. But this version is still so fucked up. The giving up mm, is so hard to do when you really love someone. Giving up mm. It's so hard to do And I try But I just ain't no use When my light of hope is burning dim But in my heart I prayed it then my love and faith in the man will bring him back someday. Hey, give it up. It's so hard to do, child. Oh my God. Like that scene always kills me because we see the scene and we see her looking disheveled and going to Sparkle and Sparkle giving her the money. And... We see Levi in jail. You know what I'm saying? We see um, Sticks working construction and reading letters from Sparkle. Like, I think he was ignoring her during this time, right? And so then we see the lights change into red to sirens while she's singing Giving Up. And it blurs. And then we're at the funeral and we see her in a casket. And at this time, this is like the moment where everybody wishes the movie would have went another way. And Sparkle's uh, singing, you know, and I
to the nine. Take my hand, oh precious Lord, and lead me home. When my will, listen. Oh my God. Um, yes, girl, it always broke my heart when she sings it. Precious Lord, hold my hand, child. And you know, you see everybody in the crowd crying and all of that. You ain't see Dolores, child. So after the funeral was over and they're all at the apartment, and Styx comes to the house to see Sparkle, and Effie lights up when she sees him. And he said, you know, she says, Sparkle's in her room. You can go ahead and see her. And he goes in there and he says, you know, he got back a few days ago and Sparkle's pissed. Sparkle says, I must have been out when you called. And he says he knows that, you know, he loves her, but, you know, he had to get himself together. And she was like, you know, he was like, I know how you feel. She was like, I know you know. I know you know how I feel. Ain't that funny? Two people in this room. And one person thinking for two people in this room, something like that, she said. Like, because he was always thinking for her. And him leaving and sister dying changed Sparkle. Sparkle went from being a young, naive woman to a pissed off, grown ass woman that feels like she lost everything. And he says he wants her to sing. And she says, what have I got to sing about? And he was like, you can't bury yourself with your sister. And she was like, nobody ever loves sister for me. Okay, she went off on him for that. Don't you ever bring up her name again. Okay, kick this ass out of her room. Like, how dare you? You finally come back. And when you come back, you come back just because you want me to sing again? Because life got too fucking hard during construction and sister dying was what you needed to come back and be able to control my mind? She was pissed. And so her mom, her mom is the one walking down the street with her saying that Sticks put his grandmother in a real nice retirement home. A lot of people around here think Sticks is a real good kid. I'm one of them. That mama pissed me off in this scene. She pissed me off because I felt like even though Sparkle should have sung, but Sparkle should have sang for herself. Sparkle should have got back into music because she wanted to do it. Not because she was falling back in love with a nigga she couldn't depend on. You know what I'm saying? Somebody that was always just trying to use her. And her mom, being a woman that doesn't have a man, let alone a man that looked like sticks with the nice hair, nice looking, trying real hard to make money. So she tells her daughter to go and get back with him. You know, I always told you, Spark, I said, you know, a man's got to do what a man's got to do. But he came back for you, didn't he? Like, what? He came back for her. Like, what? Because he wants you to sing. Wants me to sing. Like, and you should sing. And she should have. And I recognize what her mama was saying. Her mama was saying, take advantage of this opportunity before you let the grief control your life because that's what a lot of black people do a lot of black people let the grief of the things that have happened to them control their life so in one place i felt like the mama's advice was right but i also felt like it was so that she could also get out of this situation because she saw that sticks could save them both not just help sparkle but let me help Sticks get Sparkle to believe in herself so that Sparkle can save everybody. That's what it was, okay? So, Levi, we saw Levi in jail after Sparkle came to tell him that sister died. That shit was so sad. Um, so, she goes to the studio and they start working on Sparkle's album. And Sticks needs money to make the album happen. He needs $10,000. So Effie puts him in contact with Mr. Gerber. Okay. And Sticks, you know, goes to meet with him, has the monster suit. And he's asking for 10K because he knows the record company, 
you know, will try to own them forever. And all he needs is 10K to make it work. It's a loan on the amount of money instead of going through the record company and having them sign her into some fucked up ass deal, which you know they like to do. This is another, another telltale sign. It is giving Tina Turner mama vibes. Mr. Gerber asks, what's the collateral? And he says his word and whatever interest he wants. And Mr. Gerber says that he's going to borrow this money from some very, you know, dangerous, important people. And that Sticks is going to pay him back for the use of that money very handsomely. So Sticks agrees. They record, you know, because Sticks is about to be like, I'll find somebody else to do it if you're not going to do it. Okay. You know, but the dude was like, I, I got you. I got you. But I'm going to go and talk to the people. I'm going to get the money. You're going to pay me for the money. Okay. That's how it's going to go. So they work on the album. Excuse me, y'all. And we see them in the studio and they're working on Look Into Your Heart. Y'all, Look Into Your Heart is one of the hardest songs to sing. Uh, uh, let's see. If you look into your heart with a positive mind. I'm trying to go on. Take some inventory of your woman and your glory. Leave the bad things behind. Everybody's got a story about love and the good things. But for the spices of your life, you've got to pay the price if you know what I mean. And I'm telling everybody out loud that this man makes me feel so very proud. When I thought that there was nothing left, I believe I found myself. I want to give me to you, baby. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I had to mix a little bit of that read then, though. <laughs> Loving you more and more, giving you all and all of me. Ooh, I'm loving you more and giving you all and all of me. Listen, it's one of my favorite songs, but it is so hard to sing. And Aretha sings it even higher than they do. Okay, love is not an easy game, but it's strong and it's strong. Now that I see what you've given me and whatever he want to do, I want to do it with you, baby. Child, listen, it's one of the best ones. Loving you more and giving you all and all of me. Ooh, baby. Listen, uh, I was listening to it earlier. But anyway, so the 10K, they make the record, it charts. Levi's listening to it in jail. They released two singles first. Uh, hit uh, Look Into Your Heart hit number 37 on the charts, I think. They paid the money back plus interest. Sticks is like, our business is done. But Mr. Gerber tries to muscle him and tells him that the men he did the business with wants to invest in Sparkle and they want him to keep the $10,000. And Sticks says, no. <laughs> you mean to tell me you're trying to buy some of our record sales for a measly $10,000? Nah, like the men you do business with is your, is your business. Our business is done. Mr. Gerber tries to grab him and warn him that his associates are this and this and this and that and it's gonna make him look weak. And Stick said, I don't give a fuck what you talking about. That's on y'all. Okay, good day. And then you got Effie talking to Sticks, trying to warn him about the people that Mr. Gerber work with and all of this shit. Sticks said, listen, I'm a, I'm a boy from the hood. I know what I'm doing, okay? So Sparkle gets to open up for Ray Charles at Carnegie Hall, y'all. This is huge, right? And, you know, she's got the girls with the red dresses on like her and the sisters used to wear, but even more, you know, bigger and elaborate than they were. Um, and she singed, uh, loving you, uh, loving you, baby. Don't make it hard when we're trying to make it. 
Your love so satisfying, love standing near, side by side. So much faith, so much pride, loving you. Loving you. Don't leave, oh, don't leave me lonely in trouble. Just call my name and you know I'll be there on a the double. Yes, it is. Listen. Love me all the time. Ooh, sweet baby. You're so cool. 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 Loving you, baby. Don't make it hard when we're trying to make it. Listen, they were singing their ass off, right? The whole time they singing at Carnegie Hall, they playing Russian roulette with sticks in the backseat of a car. He's sweating his ass off and sticks keep saying, nope, nope, they, nope, nope, nope. And then eventually we just see the dude who was holding a gun on sticks get out the car, walk over to Mr. Gerber and shake his head knowing Mr. Gerber laughs and smiles like that's what he wanted. And they let him go. But apparently, you know, it was kind of one of them times where a wise guy is a real wise guy, where they respect it, like real recognized, real. You didn't crack, so we're going to leave you alone. But we are probably going to keep our eye on you to see if we can do business with you again, because that's how we do this shit. You know what I'm saying? But at the end, Sparkle gets up there and she says, I, I want to sing this last song for my sister and then she says well for all my sisters and she goes out there and she do you know do let me see if i can do it do <laughs> i can't do it i can't do it do 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 Do, 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 yeah. If you look into your heart. Do, 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 do. And you know, we already did. I already sang it. I ain't got to do it again. But that was the song she ended on. And she sang that one for her sister. And y'all know that's the song. You know, that's the song that Aretha did big with, you know. But another song, y'all, on this album, if y'all have never listened to the album, but y'all know that's the end of the movie. Sparkle blows up. It's the happily ever after. She got her man. She got her mama. They got their money. Everybody's great. The ending is great. It all was, you know, worth everything they went through, you know, so to speak. But the soundtrack, y'all. There's a song called Sparkle. I sparkle. Loving the way that I do, it is true, it feels so good, just having you. And lastly, and eager, submission isn't easy for me, we were so loving, wasn't we? I'll always know it could be, yeah. Don't want to do nothing, tired against your will, this ain't no cheap thrill, you gotta know just how you feel, and if you think you're gonna fall, uh, all you have to do is call, I have nothing left to say, and I give myself to you. Y'all, that song is so hard to sing. But Sparkle is the shit, y'all. I listen to that song all the time. That's literally my favorite song on the soundtrack. And y'all never hear it on the actual movie, but they play it in the background. It's the, the instrumentals. It's two songs that are instrumentals on the movie that are two of the best songs on the soundtracks. And that's I Get High and Sparkle. Y'all got to go listen to those two. It's on Apple Music. If y'all have Apple Music, y'all should go and listen to Aretha Franklin's version of the soundtrack. There is no version with Lonette McGee. And that was always an issue of contention because all of them could sing. So they could have sung the songs on the album. But everybody wanted the album to go big. And Aretha 
is big. You know what I'm saying? And she still sang the shit out of it, okay? Lonette McGee is still with us. Yes, she is. Okay, I feel like Dawn Smith is still with us as well that played Dolores. But, uh, you know, R.I.P. to Irene Cara that just died last year, um, I believe. So, yeah, y'all. Um, one of my favorite movies of all time. When I was watching it, I was like, I can't believe that this was a movie that I would watch all the time as a kid because it's so dark. You know what I'm saying? Um, oh, yes. No, I love. Like, but... After this one, we're going to be doing Disappearing X. That's the next one. So I hope y'all enjoyed this. Um, child, I know I sing for my diaphragm. That's how I know this song is hard to sing because I sing for my diaphragm, okay? If y'all, you know, if y'all wasn't going to do nothing today, y'all needed to hear that I was singing for my diaphragm with most of this. I just try not to, like, hit notes that I know I'm not comfortable with when I'm on live. That's just not what I do, okay? Girl, we're going to work it out, okay? I ain't ready. I ain't warmed up enough to get up to the Aretha Franklin. Don't want to do nothing. And like the way she kept hitting that shit <laughs> Tired against your will Is there ain't no cheap thrill You got to know just how it feels Listen And if you think you're gonna fall All you have to do is call I have nothing left to say And I give myself to you Child, listen but I sings it, girl. I sings it. This is how, this right here, okay, exactly, the ab, it's an ab workout for real. But this right here, y'all, this movie, this movie and what's love got to do with it are the reason why y'all get me the way y'all get me. The reason why I am the performer that I am is because of movies like this, <laughs> okay? But yes, this is right. Aretha could do it effortless. No, her, her, her vocals are insane. Like, I could never, I could never, but I could try. <laughs> I can try I can try girl okay but I love y'all I hope y'all enjoy the live please don't forget to like comment subscribe to the channel come back for the next now that we're grown I hope y'all are enjoying the now that we're grown because I so enjoy doing them so love y'all hope y'all have a good rest of y'all day and all my members I will be up with y'all tomorrow for Love and Marriage Huntsville and put a ring on it and, you know, all the regular people, we're going to get into Real Housewives of Atlanta as well. So, I'll see y'all. And Disappearing Next is the next Y that, uh, I mean, the next Now That We're Grown. And then Medea's Family Reunion is right after that. So, I'll be looking for what's to come right after. But anyway, y'all, I love y'all so much. I enjoyed doing this. This made my day. Y'all don't know how much I love this movie. So, I will see y'all in the next one. Bye.